Okay, let's make a start now. Today's lecture is going to be an application of all the phase transformation theory we've done towards the design of some novel metallic alloys. And I'll begin by summarizing the mechanism of the Bainite transformation that we studied. That basically, the transformation happens without any diffusion. So a plate of uh, Bainite forms magnetically. Is it too dim? Yeah, I think we need to adjust it from from there. summary of the mechanism of the transformation that we did, that a plate of bainite formed without any diffusion, but shortly afterwards, carbon is partitioned into the remaining austenite, and it then precipitates as cementite particles to give us this upper bainite mine structure. If we form the bainite at a relatively low temperature, then you also precipitate carbides inside the plate, because there's time to do that. The diffusion rate has slowed down. And you partition less carbon into the austenite, so you end up with thinner cementite particles in the low bainite microstructure. Now, one of the problems with bainite as a microstructure is these particles. These particles precipitate during the course of transformation, so we don't have much control over their size or distribution. So, bainitic steels in the context of high strength steels simply haven't been very successful until fairly recently, because these cementite particles uh, give the material a very low toughness compared with tempered mining site where you can control the precipitation process. So this is an illustration of the sort of carbide particles, and you can see the scale here. They are uh, of the order of a fraction of a micrometer in size, and for a high strength steel, that's like a hard inclusion in the material. So you really don't want them. And when you measure the toughness, uh, it, is, it is bad. You can see that the impact transition temperature here is well above room temperature. Are you familiar with Charlie testing? Yes, so you take a piece of metal with the right sort of notch, give it a thumb, and measure the energy absorbed. So this is the reason why high strength magnetic steels haven't been successful. Now, you can actually get rid of that cementite precipitation process. If I go back to this slide, we want to stop the reaction at this stage so that the cementite simply doesn't precipitate and we end up with just a mixture of these plates of ferrite and carbon-enriched austenite, which remains stable to room temperature. And we can do that by suppressing the cementite. Now, do you know, in the context of cast ions, you know, how you change a white cast iron to a grey cast iron. So a white cast iron has most of the carbon tied up as cementite, whereas a grey cast iron, you've got graphite in one form or another. So what is a key composition, compositional feature, which allows you to make either white cast iron or grey cast iron? Silicon. Silicon, absolutely. So you add sufficient silicon and you suppress the precipitation of cementite because silicon doesn't dissolve in the cementite lattice. So if you add sufficient silicon, then you end up with grey cast iron with flakes of graphite, whereas without uh, or with a low concentration of silicon, you end up with very hard white cast iron. So we can do the same here, that if we add approximately 2 weight percent of silicon to the steel, then you suppress the precipitation of cementite from austenite, and you end up with a mixture of these fine plates of uh, bainitic ferrite. Look at, look at the scale here. So these are only about a quarter of a micrometer in thickness. And that's a grain size which is very difficult to achieve by other methods, for example, by recrystallization <coughs> or by thermomechanical processing. Here we achieve a quarter micrometer grain size simply by phase transformation. And instead of the cementite, we end up with these films of carbon-enriched retained austenite. 
So this is an ideal microstructure in several senses. Firstly, we have a very fine grain size, and fine grain size helps you to get high strength. Okay. You know, from uh, you know the whole batch relationship, where the yield strength increases with d to the minus a half, where d is the grain size. But a similar relationship applies for plate shapes, that the finer you make the plates, the greater is the strength. Uh, secondly, we are not producing strength by carbon. The carbon isn't actually in the body-centered cubic lattice. It has partition into the austenite. The carbon tends to make uh, ferrite very brittle. You, you know that untempered martensite is brittle, isn't it? So that's another advantage. We don't have any semen type particles in this microstructure because we've suppressed them with uh, uh, silicon. And furthermore, we have this nice austenite which has been produced simply by the carbon partition. So we don't need to use any expensive alloying elements to stabilize that austenite to room temperature. And austenite has the property that it doesn't have a ductile brittle transition temperature. Yeah. Are you familiar with the ductile brittle transition temperature? So austenite does not fail by cleavage. So we've got a nice composite microstructure on a very, very fine scale. And it should have wonderful strength and toughness. <coughs> it turns out that it actually has very poor toughness. So if you measure the properties of carbide free bainite of the type that I illustrated in the previous slide, once again, the impact transition temperature is well above room temperature. You really want that to be below room temperature, so that failure is always in this ductile region of the impact transition curve. So there's something wrong with our ideal microstructure. You know, we've got all this fine grain size, austenite present, no semen type particles, and yet we're getting an incredibly bad toughness. <coughs> now, the thing that is wrong is that T0 curve. Is everybody happy with the T0 curve, or shall I give you a quick reminder of what it is? Okay, so here's a reminder. <coughs> so I'm plotting here the free energy versus the carbon concentration. And on the same graph, I'm plotting uh, temperature. So here's uh, alpha and the gamma, so ferrite, austenite, free energy curves at a particular temperature, T1, and at this point, the austenite and ferrite of the same chemical composition have the same free energy. So diffusion-less transformation is thermodynamically impossible here because the free energy rises if I transform austenite to ferrite of the same composition. But it is possible if the austenite has a chemical composition less than this point here get a reduction in free energy. If I plot the locus of these points as a function of temperature, because this diagram is for a constant temperature, then I get on the phase diagram a line which is called the T0 line. And this point here corresponds to this particular temperature T1. Austenite cannot transform to ferrite without a composition change <coughs> if it lies in this region. Here, diffusion-less transformation <coughs> is possible in principle. Okay. So it defines the limit within the phase, the domain within the phase diagram where diffusion-less transformation is possible. And if I start with an alloy of this composition here, say, then the amount of bainite that I can form is limited by that T0 curve. There's nothing you can do to make it progress further than that curve because of the mechanism of transformation. So what happens is when you look at the optical microstructure, so look at the scale here, this is the optical microstructure, the reaction simply stops at some point where the composition of the austenite hits the T0 curve. So you've got this absolutely wonderful microstructure with very fine grains and nice films of retained austenite and these large blocks of austenite, which under the slightest bit of stress transform to high carbon untempered martensite. Because large grains are unstable to martensite transmission. So it's like creating a, a really beautiful microstructure, 
and then throwing into it bricks <coughs> which are of the order of 50 micrometers in size because these transform into very hard regions of mud inside under the influence of stress. <coughs> so this really puts a spanner in the works that the scale of the microstructure which determines the toughness is this huge unit here rather than the very fine structure that you see in the transmission electron microbe. And the reason why we have these large regions of austenite is the T0 curve. No matter how long I hold it at the transformation temperature, this won't progress. We've reached the T0 curve. We have to do something to get rid of these large regions of austenite. So here's the T0 curve plotted out again. And xt0 simply refers to the composition at a point on that curve. And x bar is our average of the concentration. So you can use the lever root to work out the fraction of beta that you will get. Because you can assume that the ferrite contains zero carbon. If so, the solubility of carbon in the ferrite is negligible, isn't it? Okay. So I haven't drawn here the curve for the solubility of carbon in ferrite, but you can assume it's zero. So just from the lever root, this distance divided by this distance gives me the fraction of payment. Yeah? Now looking at that diagram, I'd like you to tell me three ways in which I can increase that fraction, because look, if I can increase the fraction of bainite, I get rid of these large regions. Yeah? So have a look at this equation while I rub the board out. <coughs> And tell me three ways in which I could increase the fraction of payment. Decrease the temperature. So the first thing is you can decrease the transformation temperature. Temperature. Because if I transform here, then obviously I will get a larger amount of power. Now what is the limit to how low I can go? Sorry? Uh, that, no, it's a very good point. The transformation can become very slow at low temperatures. Later on, I'll show you a case where it takes 10 days to form the Okay? But there's another limit as well. Why can you form up side of here if you like? Yeah, exactly. So two things. One is kinetics slows down. Kinetics sluggish if you go too low. And we might stimulate the thing to transform to mud inside. So it has to be above the MS temperature. Okay. <clears throat> Any other method for increasing the fraction? Okay. Decrease the average. Decrease the average. Yeah. yeah. So if we decrease the value of X bar here, <coughs> if I move this to a lower concentration, then of course I will get a larger fraction of bainite, the strength will not decrease. Yeah, because the strength is coming from the ferrite, the fine plates of time. So this is interesting because by decreasing the carbon concentration, we are not going to reduce the strength. Because we're going to increase the fraction of the harder phase. Okay? So we can decrease X bar. X bar. And the third method, Think of uh, the free energy curves. What affects the free energy curves? Okay. So by altering the free energy curves, I can alter the T zero. Yeah. Sir? Yeah, exactly. So we we have lots and lots of substitutional <laughs> solutes that we can add <coughs> to change the relative stabilities of the ferrite and osmium. So we can actually manipulate the T0 curve, move it to larger concentrations, and that will give us an increase in the fraction of beta. So use substitutional solutes to increase X T0. Now, the really interesting thing is that we are not simply going to do this by trial and error. You know, we've got this very simple equation, and these, this is exactly how we will radically change the properties of this field. 
So we started with one particular composition, which is this one, with very bad properties. We're going to use this method to change its properties drastically. So I'm going to show you, first of all, uh, that you know if you alter the substitution of alloy content, you can shift the T0 curve. So supposing we substitute manganese with nickel, then the T0 curve moves to higher carbon concentration. Uh, these calculations can be done routinely. Okay, you can just download some software from my website and do these calculations, or you can buy it if you wish. So there's no difficulty in doing these free energy curve calculations. Um, what we are trying to do is get rid of these large regions of austenite, and we'll design two steels, one in which we have halved the carbon concentration. From 0.4, if you remember, the previous one was 0.4 weight percent. We've changed it to 0.2 weight percent. And the second way, we've kept the carbon concentration constant, but substituted nickel for manganese to shift the T0 curve. And this is just to show you that the microstructures are nice microstructures. We've lost those large regions of austenite. We, this is just a dark field image of the retained austenite. This is a bright field image. So, using that simple equation, we've designed these two microstructures in which we've got rid of the large blocks of austenite. And it's really quite remarkable, the change in impact properties. This was the original alloy here, 0.4 carbon, 3 manganese, 2 silicon. By either by substituting manganese with nickel or by halving the carbon concentration and without any loss of strength because toughness should be compared at the same strength level. It's no point in saying that, look, uh, I've got a high toughness if you reduce the strength to that of aluminium. We shifted the impact transition temperature by 200 degrees centigrade. That is really quite remarkable. So, using the theory that you have learned in this course, you could have designed this alloy, these two alloys, which shift the impact transition temperature by 200 degrees centigrade, well below room temperature. And these are, of course, now being used uh, to make new kinds of rail steels, okay, which have really impressive properties, have absolutely no carbides. Do you know what the microstructure of a normal rail steel is? It's basically um, like this. Do you know what this is? Perlite, yeah? So you have, uh, you know, we think of this as alternating layers of cementite and ferrite, but I think I explained to you that that's not the proper way of thinking, right? It really is like having a cabbage, which represents the cementite, a single crystal of cementite. All the leaves are connected in three dimensions. Put the cabbage in a bucket of water, and all the ferrite is con connected in three dimensions. So it's really the colony is a bicrystal of ferrite and cementite. And that is what determines the fracture properties, because the crack goes undeviated across that colony. So when we look at this microstructure, it isn't the spacing here which determines the toughness, but the spacing here which determines the toughness, because that whole region is a single colony of perlite. So although you can increase the strength, you can't increase the toughness by making the lamella spacing narrow. So ordinary rail steels are more brittle than they ought to be because even though they are very rare resistance because you've reduced the spacing of the perlite, uh, they are not tough. Whereas this new, new material contains no carbides. So the properties are really good. One of, one of the characteristics you look for in a rail steel is rolling contact fatigue. So every time a wheel goes on top of a rail, it induces a stress under the surface. And that's a cyclic stress, and therefore material peels off the rail. Okay, so that's called rolling contact fatigue. And these are full-scale tests. And you can see that the perlitic steel, the martensitic steel, and the new bainitic steel, the carbide-free bainitic steel, really outperforms any of these normal uh, rail alloys. And the wear resistance is also remarkably good. So we want the wear rate to be as small as possible, both on the rail and on the wheel. And this is the only microstructure which reduces the wear rate 
on a wheel. And the reason is that we don't have these hard particles which break off and serve as an abrasive. So th this actually is a real train carrying 300 tons of molten steel going on this new bailing of steel which has been designed using the theory that we've learned in this lecture. And just to show you that you can control the strength of these steels by altering the transformation temperature, the size of the bainite plates. And this is another set of steels designed using the same theory with a strength of uh, about 1600 megapascals. And this is a very, very high toughness, about 130 megapascal root meters. The same as that of Maraging steels, which are 90 times more expensive. Now, the basic concept, uh, I hope everybody is clear with, is that we don't want those large regions of austenite, which are there because of the thermodynamic limit to diffusion less transformation. And we can manipulate those islands of austenite by controlling the average carbon concentration and the T0 curve and keeping the transformation temperature as low as possible. Right. Now, just to give you an idea, yeah. Uh, on the previous slide, did you explain the units of fracture toughness? Yeah, really so fracture toughness is usually written like this, K1C, that means the toughness in tension, okay. and it has units of megapascal root meters, okay. because basically this allows you to calculate, this is uh, also known as stress intensity, and it's a critical stress intensity. So this allows you to calculate the stress ahead of a crack tip. So if this is my crack tip, then you get a stress distribution like this. And you can calculate that stress as a function of distance ahead of the crack tip. And you can calculate the stress intensity that is required to propagate the crack rapidly. That determines the fracture toughness. You, you can apply a stress as long as the crack doesn't propagate rapidly. So, at some stage during your part two course, you will be doing fracture toughness and you'll come across this parameter. What, why is there a root? Yeah, in there. so let me just, uh, sigma times A to the half is equal to K1C, correct? So where sigma is the applied stress, uh, for fracture, A is the crack size. Yeah. So if you have a crack which is, uh, it has a length A, and you're pulling in this direction, then when sigma reaches the value sigma F, which is given by this, yes. so. I, I could actually write sigma f equals k1c over a to the half. So when sigma reaches the, the critical value sigma f, the crack propagates rapidly. So it's a measure of the stress required to cause the crack to propagate rapidly. So maraging steels contain a very large concentration of nickel and also of molybdenum, and that's why they are very, very expensive. They are also very good seals. You know, they're used for rocket motor casings. Um, a rocket only works once, so you use really quite thin steel, uh, but very tough steel, and during the course of the firing, it actually plastically deforms, it expands, yeah, because you don't need to use it again. Okay. I'm now going to talk about some really high strength steels. Okay, so I talked about 1600 megapascal, but you need to appreciate what strength means. You know, the weight of an apple is approximately a newton, believe it or not, correct? You put it onto a square meter, and that's the stress of one pascal. So one megapascal means that the material can support the weight of a million apples on one square meter. And one gigapascal means you can support the weight of a billion apples on one square meter. So I'm going to talk about the same kind of microstructure that we've discussed for the rail steel, but you're able to support two and a half billion apples on one square meter. 
And <coughs> this is a calculation of the temperature at which bainite can form and the temperature at which martensite can form uh, for a hy hypothetical alloy. And the most important point to note here is that these two temperatures both decrease together. In other words, there's no point there where the MS becomes the same as BS. So we can actually form bainite in any of these alloys without worrying about martensite forming. This is in Kelvin, so room temperature is approximately here. And what this says uh, is that it's possible in principle to form bainite at room temperature. Now why would we want to do that? Well, it, first of all, it's very interesting. And secondly, uh, the lower the temperature, the finer the scale of the microstructure. But as you pointed out, you know, the kinetics of the reaction might slow down. Okay? So just notice that uh, here we are in excess of one weight percent of carbon. If we do a kinetic calculation, the time required to form bainite, you know, it'll, it'll take a year here, and if I go to this, it'll take a few centuries to actually form bainite. So realistically, we can cope with time scales of the order of days. So we made an alloy with about one weight percent carbon, with the silicon to suppress the uh, cement drag, and the remaining alloying elements are there to control the T0 curve and to control impurities which will always be there. Okay, but the composition is basically very simple. We are going to get a simple microstructure of bainite plus um, retained austenite, and we'll transform at temperatures as low as 125 degrees centigrade. So that is lower than the temperature at which you cook pizza. Yeah, pizza is cooked between 180 degrees centigrade and 220 degrees centigrade, or for our American friends at 400 F. Okay. So, just to give you an idea of what that means for a metal like steel, the diffusion distance of an iron atom at 125 degrees centigrade for a period of 10 days is 10 to the minus 17 meters. So it's impossible for an iron atom to move during the course of transformation. So I'm just pointing that out so that you understand uh, or we emphasize the fact that the Bainite reaction is a displacive transformation. It doesn't require the diffusion of atoms. Uh, don't worry about the details. What I want you to look at is that after this transformation, the hardness is incredibly high, between six and 700 Richter's. Now, this is comparable to the hardness of the hardest martensite that you can get. And why? Why are we getting such a high hardness? Because we are not retaining carbon in solid solution in the ferrite. And martensite gets most of its strength from carbon in solid solution. So this is very peculiar. This is the highest ever recorded hardness for bainite. And this is just to show you that the calculated time for transformation here is comparable to what we measured. Remembering that nobody produced bainite at this sort of temperatures before. Well, you look at the optical microstructure, it doesn't look remarkable, so it doesn't explain why we have this incredibly high hardness. But the next two micrographs I'm going to show you are, in my opinion, the best micrographs that I've ever seen. Okay? Have a good look. These are transmission electron micrographs, and of course they represent a very, very tiny region of this microstructure. So these are plates of bainite, and this is the austenite, and look at the scale here, 50 nanometers. Okay? And here is a lower transformation temperature. Look at the scale here, 20 nanometers. Now, when you have a plate shape, it's the thickness which determines the strength, because the mean free slip distance is approximately two times the thickness. So this is incredible for a couple of reasons. First of all, we have produced this by transformation. There's no thermomechanical processing, there's no rapid cooling, and there's no deformation involved here. We simply take the austenite at 1000 degrees centigrade and slowly 
take it to a pizza oven and leave it there for a few days and we generate the microstructure. And that means that we can produce it in really large lumps of material. And you know, there are so many people all over the world trying to produce nanocrystalline material by all kinds of exotic methods, expensive alloying additions. Here, this is incredibly cheap. All we are using is silicon, carbon, manganese. And the pizza. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Now, when you, we can, this, is, this has a strength of about two and a half gigapascals, so two and a half billion apples on one square meter, and extremely good toughness, given that it's a dirty steel, you know, it's an experimental steel. Um, you can get steels which are even stronger than this. So, for example, um, this is five and a half gigapascals strong. And it's made by taking uh, you know, uh, an alloy of iron and deforming it severely to a true strain of nine. So that's like taking 50 grams of material and stretching it out to two kilometers. And yet, you know, it's very ductile. You can tie a knot with it. You couldn't tie a knot with a carbon fiber. Yeah, it has zero ductility. Now, the problem, of course, is that you produce the strength by severe deformation. So you're limited in the form of the material you can produce. So if I give you an idea of the dimensions of this wire that you can buy commercially, uh, you know, these are stockings and this is a sock. And there are some very strange units used to describe the thickness of those threads. So a denier is a weight in grams of nine kilometers of fiber. Okay, so don't ask me how we came up with this definition. And the sock is about 50 denier and stockings are about 10 denier. And that wire that I showed you, it's called cipher because it's scientific iron, <laughs> um, is nine denier. Now you can't make an engineering structure out of something which is just nine denier in size. Similarly, if you have to produce the nanocrystalline state by very rapid cooling, you are limited in the size because you can't get a uniform cooling rate if you have a large sample. With this material that I showed you, you can actually produce very large components. Uh, there are already applications for it. Um, I can quickly show you some information that I got just this week. And it's just one application. There are many applications being considered. So for example, uh, the car industry is looking towards making gears and shafts out of this material because there will be no residual stresses. You don't have to cool very rapidly to get the very native microstructure. But there is a, another application which is very interesting. So I haven't got this in a PowerPoint presentation, but <coughs> this is the actual material that I showed you, the transmission electron microgram for, being fired at by some of the more deadly rounds that you use in a battlefield complex. Okay? And normally, um, you measure the efficiency of an armor with something called the ballistic mass efficiency. Right? And there's a standard armor which has a ballistic mass efficiency of one. And you use an exotic armor like titanium-6, aluminium-4, vanadium, that has a ballistic mass efficiency of 1.6. The higher the number, the better the armor. This stuff has a ballistic mass efficiency of two. Okay. And it can take multiple hits. So, you know, ceramic armor is good, but it can take one hit. And after that, it's, it's not able to support, um, it's not able to protect. This can take multiple hits. And here, the projectiles really haven't even penetrated the material. So, if you look at the back surface of this, you can see that there's no penetration uh, through the arm. Okay. And I'll just show you one more to show you the... That's not the same type as like Kevlar. No. Um, Kevlar is good, but these are really high velocity projectiles that you fire uh, to protect you know, cars or tanks or helicopters or whatever. So look, you can take multiple hits on this without breaking it. 
So they are exciting developments using this incredibly fine microstructure which you can produce in bulk material. Do you have any questions? <laughs>